Advent, as you know, is a time of serious spiritual reform. In this season, men are meant to give more thought to the state of their immortal soul. And they are meant to put more effort into their spiritual life. Not, for example, not praying just for the sake of praying, just to check it off your list of things that you need to do. Not simply going through all the motions of a spiritual life, coming to Mass on Sunday, simply because you have to or just to get it over with, or following the commandments of the church, such as the Friday abstinence, simply because there is no way around it. But truly, we are meant in this penitential and hopeful season of Advent to clean up our soul of all that would hinder the coming of Christ on Christmas Day. But for this, this duty of ours, we must have firm and determined resolution to persevere even when the going gets tough. What went you out to see? Our Lord asked his disciples today. A reed shaken by the wind? The reed in today's gospel symbolizes inconstancy. A perfect example of this is when the Jews, just before the Passion of Christ, they were all out there celebrating that Christ had come to their city and they acknowledged him to be king. They threw their palm branches and their cloaks down and they honored him with shouts of Hosanna to the son of David. And yet they were so inconstant. They were those reeds shaken by the wind that only a few days later, those who had pronounced him to be king now are calling out for his death. And not only his death, but the most shameful form of death known to men at that time. The shameful death reserved simply for criminals. Inconstancy in the spiritual life is caused by many different things. It could be human respect. It could be the way that culture sways back and forth between bad and really bad. And you're like that reed shaken by the wind. It could be caused by laziness and fear of effort. It's just too hard to do what God requires. But the most dangerous of all that causes inconstancy is called discouragement and despondency. By far, this is the most dangerous temptation of the devil. And it is the the tool that he uses most of all. By his other weapons... He attacks only a single virtue. And it could be he might be attacking holy purity. He might be attacking your faith. He might be attacking your patience or your meekness. But in all of those temptations, you see exactly what is going on. And you see that it is clearly a temptation. You easily see the evil that would happen, would come about if you consented to it. And then you remember all of the principles of our faith which motivate you to overcome those temptations. Your conscience screams out, do not give in. And so you are more ready to conquer those temptations. But in discouragement, there is nothing that gives us assistance. We feel that we are much too weak to do what God asks of us at that moment. 
and confidence in God, which is indispensable in the spiritual life to advance anywhere, is lacking. We feel so wretched and so helpless that we desire to give up everything. And this is the end game which Satan has in mind when he leads us into discouragement, that we give it all up. This feeling of discouragement presents the attainment of virtue as something which is impossible and thus exposes us to the danger of being carried away by different passions. Now, on this subject, we must first be persuaded that discouragement is a temptation. For there is never a true motive why we should be discouraged. There is never any hardship that should really be a reason to lead us to be to a lack of courage. Not your weaknesses. They should not be a source of discouragement. For our Lord is the Good Shepherd and He knows His sheep and all of their weaknesses and He goes out in search of them and places them on his shoulder, and brings them to greener pastures. Not your past sins, even though they might have been many and grave. Because we know that unless first there is misery, there can be no mercy. It is our misery which attracts the mercy of God. And if we show a little contrition for our sins, we can be certain that God's mercy will follow. And so there is never a reason to give in to this temptation. And it is only a temptation. For every thought which is contrary to God's law is a true sign or insinuation of the devil. So here's what you do. Whenever a thought of any sort pops into your mind that troubles you, you have to weigh it according to this rule. Is this thought that troubles me here and now against faith, hope, or charity, or any other virtue? If it is, then we must consider it to be a temptation. Turn away from it and make acts of the contrary virtue. So, in temptations to discouragement, you will be, you will want to make acts of confidence in Almighty God, and acts of hope. Now, discouragement is a temptation against that very virtue of hope. And as I said, it is most dangerous to go through this temptation. For what is a man without hope? Hope of success, or hope of happiness, hope of gain, even if only material gain, urges man to action. It pushes him towards his final goal. Whatever goal or objective he had in mind, if there is no hope in achieving that goal, he quickly gives it all up. And he sits. Hope motivates these men, and I see it in the business world all the time. When I travel on the plains and meet all of these businessmen, their hope for success is so great that they will overcome all obstacles in order to attain their goal. That is what hope does. Take it away, and he will soon stop striving for what he once thought to be a desirable thing. A soul which does not hope to succeed in the spiritual warfare and to acquire virtue will undertake very little or nothing at all. The smallest exertion made while in this state only increases the weakness And by discouragement, the soul even anticipates that she is already overcome. 
and the soul allows her passions to overcome her. A glance at her own weakness throws her into a state of disquiet and irresolution. And then what happens is that she loses sight of the principles of faith which alone guide the soul through temptation. And that is why a discouraged soul is so easily defeated. And she is so blinded that she fails to see the very weapons which God puts into her hands. And then she is faced to approach the enemy without any weapon in hand. And she is slain. A soul that that is discouraged forgets this one great principle of our faith. That the goodness of our Heavenly Father is our protection and our defense. And if we wish to overcome anything in the spiritual life, we have only to run to God as to our Father. But you see, again, discouragement not only deprives the soul of the ability to see the principles of faith that ought to encourage her, but it also robs the soul of her spirit of prayer. And so one that is given in to these feelings of discouragement does not feel like praying. And that becomes dangerous for It is through prayer that the grace to overcome comes to us. If you're neglecting the prayers, you will not overcome. It does not have to be that when you're discouraged that you offer long prayers. No, short ones that increase the feelings of confidence and of hope. And so the church today puts these similar prayers on our lips today. Today, the second Sunday of Advent, is a day on which we find hope in the liturgy. In the breviary, the priest and the church prays, Thy salvation cometh quickly. Why art thou wasted away with sorrow? I will save thee and deliver thee. Fear not. As a mother comforteth her sons, so will I comfort thee, saith the Lord. And again, in our pursuit of virtue, God does not want anxiety or discouragement. If he proposes that we ought to be perfect, as his heavenly Father is perfect, then he will not leave us alone, but he will help and sustain us. In the introit it says, Behold, the Lord shall come to save the nations. He came not to condemn, but to save. And in the epistle, St. Paul encourages us to confidence and to rejoicing when he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. And then in order to stimulate our hope a bit more, the Messiah's in the gospel presents to us his wonderful works. The blind see, he says. The lame walk. Lepers are cured. The deaf hear. The dead rise again. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. It is as if he were saying by those words, see all of my miraculous works. And then realize there is no reason for your soul to be discouraged. For there is nothing that is more powerful than my mercy and my ability to help you through your misery. So, to conclude, remember that this season of Advent is one of hopeful expectation of the Messiah. It is truly our wretchedness, our sinfulness, which made God come down to earth and to seek that which was lost. He did not come because we are perfect, because we are holy, because we are good. He came because we are miserable 
little wretches who have sinned and turned their backs on their Creator. It was that that brought Him down to earth so that He could seek us and pick us up and carry us to heaven. And so these weeks we wait with hope and with patience so that at Christmas we can once again kneel before the Christ child and say to Him with all confidence, Now my salvation is at hand. Away with discouragement. The Christ child loves me, and it is in him that I place all my hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.